Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Quinn Sullivan here from Empower Texans. Really appreciate you taking time to join us in the statewide teleform with Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager. Uh, uh, throughout our time together this evening, you can um, ask questions and offer comments to Comptroller Hager. Um, if you are on the phone, press star three on your home phone. Again, press star three on your home phone. That will put you in the lineup to ask questions or offer comments. If you're listening to us on Facebook, um, you can either dial the number and the access code that's on your screen or just type in your questions uh, there in the uh, question box, and uh, we will throw those into the mix also. Um, so again, press star three if you're on your home phone, or there in the question and uh, know in the comment box, so your questions and comments there on Facebook, and we'll get to those as well. But again, uh, press star three throughout our time together, and that will let you ask questions and offer comments. Um, Glenn Hager was elected as the 36th Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts in November of 2014. He is essentially Texas's chief financial officer. He's the state's treasurer, the check writer, the tax collector, the um, procurement officer, and revenue estimator. Now, prior to being our comptroller, he served in the Texas House and in the Texas Senate, where he distinguished himself by promoting legislation to uh, make, uh, make, make our state finances more accountable and more transparent. He's a 1993 graduate of Texas A&M University and a graduate of St. Mary's University. He's a sixth-generation Texan who grew up farming land that's been in his family since the mid-1800s. He and his wife have three children. Glenn Hager, thank you so much for taking time to be with us. You've had an incredibly uh, busy week um, uh, with, with not only your, your regular course of your job, but this week, of course, you released your uh, biennial budget revenue estimate for the state of Texas, letting lawmakers know um, how much is available or will be available for them to spend over the coming biennium. We'll talk about that stuff in a second, but before we get going, for the folks on the call who maybe uh, never had the opportunity to visit with you, um, you know, give folks an idea of why you chose to run for comptroller, you know, to, to be the tax collector, to be the, uh, the, the state's treasurer. Let folks know kind of a little bit about your background and, and why that position was so important to you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a fantastic question. And, you know, if you look at kind of my background, my history, as you said, I'm a sixth-generation Texan, grew up on a family farm. Most people think, oh, well, you just throw some seeds out, God lets it rain, you harvest it, and it's done. Well, <laughs> my family, not only did we have – Farming operations, equipment dealership, grain elevators. So after I got out of school, I went back and worked with the family. Family's important to me, as, as you know, a lot of Texans are. And so I worked in the family businesses. And the long short of it is kind of my niche and what I mm. really enjoy is taking the data that we have, extrapolating out where do we need to go, how do we make our operation more efficient, more effective, how do we put our resources in a better, better area. And so taking that skill set as well as, you know, the fact serving the legislature doesn't qualify you to be the state CFO. However, you interact with the legislature and you help. You're not the policymaker anymore because now you're in the executive branch. You run the treasury. You pay the bills, as you mentioned, the revenue estimator. And amazingly, Texas is the 10th largest economy in the entire world, $1.6 trillion economy. And so my skill set of really pouring into the data, the numbers, asking the tough questions and trying to get us in a direction and really making sure that my concern is is making sure that Texas, we have four AAA ratings today, and I want to make sure that Texas maintains on that path and what better place than the place that has the money. The fact is the controller's office is really the central nervous system for our state government, and you can really make a difference in making sure that our state's balance sheet and the accountability transparency in government from no better place than from the controller's office. If we're doing a live call with Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager, uh, so excited to have so many folks uh, participating in the call from around the state. Uh, we want to uh, let, let you ask questions and offer comments to your comptroller. You know, Glenn Hager works for you, and you can uh, get into that lineup to ask questions um, and offer comments by pressing star three on your home phone. If you're listening to this on Facebook, um, all you need to do is just uh, throw your questions and comments into the comment box, or you can dial the phone number 
that appears there on your screen. Mm -hmm. um, Comptroller Hager, before uh, before we, we, we get to, to questions from, from other people, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the um, about the, uh, the the revenue estimates that your office put out this week. You know, much has been made here over the uh, the, you know, the these last few months of the Obama administration that you know, uh, he's done such wonders uh, for the economy. He's done amazing Sorry. things. <laughs> and, and I know, yeah, you, I know I, you're choking. Right? I lost it and yeah, had to I, chuckle I, out I, loud. I, I can just feel you wanting to reach through the screen and uh, the, the phone line and slap me real quick. But you know, walk through kind of how Texas, um, Texas economy um, has really been leading the nation and, and why that's been so important. If you look at the course of, let's just say, the last decade, Texas has continued to outpace the U.S. economy, actually because of the contraction in the oil and gas industry and manufacturing industries, which are two of our largest industries and contributing to our gross state product. When they contracted so much after oil prices declined there throughout 2015, Texas still grew in what we call fiscal year 16, which was what we closed the books on on August of last year. However, we were really just right behind the U.S. economy as far as growth. However, Texas has outpaced the U.S. economy. We outpaced the U.S. economy during the 1990s when oil prices were little or nothing. And so Texas, if you look at since the Great Recession, in other words, the recession of 07, Texas has gained over 2 million jobs here in the state. And other energy states, whether it's Louisiana across the border back to the east or Oklahoma, New Mexico, Wyoming, North Dakota, Alaska, other states that, that have a large mining sector, which is mostly oil and gas, those states, they're still negative jobs. However, in the last 12 months, because of the diversity in Texas, as far as the economic diversity in industries, we've actually gained 210,000 jobs despite those losses in manufacturing and mining, which shows kind of the strength and the diversity of this state. And interestingly, We've actually gained jobs 19 out of the last 20 months. And so Texas is, is really kind of a shining star. We always say that here in Texas, but it truly is as far as a lot of the, state, the, the nation's jobs that were gained after the 2007 recession, the bulk of those were where? Right here in Texas. Uh, so uh, President-elect President Trump um, has been talking a lot about the need for – uh, for, for manufacturing jobs, wanting to you know, bring manufacturing back to uh, back uh, you know, back to our shores, as it were. Um, how do manufacturing jobs? Um, what, what does that mean for the economy? Is it important for Texas to be trying to uh, to get you know the, those manufacturing jobs? Yeah, if you if you look at all of the different jobs in Texas, if you want to talk about from a income level, as in what you get paid on average in those industries, whether the number one, even though they don't they don't. They don't create as many jobs as other industries, but as far as the pay scale, it's high. And that would be one in the oil and gas sector, about $124,000 a job. In manufacturing, your, your average is seventy dollars or $80,000 a job. So those are very well-paying jobs. And even as we look in 2017, manufacturing of today is different than manufacturing of 20 and 30 years ago. And, and what do I mean by that? Is that you're not going to see as many jobs in each manufacturing site as you used to, in part because robotics are partly replacing people that used to do the job themselves as in welding or putting the pieces together. However, now you have many more people that are engineers walking around with a tablet, making sure that all the system is operating at the level that it should be. And so you, you will end up having a smaller number of jobs in manufacturing but the pay scale will be even higher. And so it's really critical. It's important. Texas, amazingly, we in the, here in the last decade and really in the last five years has had literally tens of billions of dollars of investment in the state in part in new manufacturing, in capacity, part because we have cheap natural gas and we have a plenty of it, and that helps is the fuel stock for running operations as you manufacture items of whatever you're going to sell, whether it's in the country or whether you're exporting it to other countries. Uh, so uh, yesterday you released the revenue forecast for the state of Texas. Um, uh, you know, you know, almost immediately we heard uh, the, the, the shrieks of terror uh, coming from the left for whom there is never a, um, a, a missed opportunity to want to advocate for higher taxes and more spending. Um, you put out a, a revenue forecast that was 
um, mm-hmm. not what, uh, what I guess uh, some of the spenders were hoping to be able to have. Since are we in a um, you know a, a down economy? Are we? Um, you know, what what, yeah, what does the ready forecast mean for, um, uh, for 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 the average section? Yeah, if you look at Texas, we project in my office that Texas is going to continue to grow. We're going to grow at a little bit more modest rate than what we were accustomed to back in in roughly five six years ago. However, the fact is, is Texas is poised to grow really about, oh, 2.7% this year. We expect that to go even higher to 3% in what we call fiscal 2018, which starts in September because our budget year doesn't follow exactly the calendar year. And then we expect it to tick up even higher to 3.1%. We expect job gains to continue. People continue to move to Texas. Why? Because the foundation of a good economy compared to other states is much better in Texas. I mean, give you for example, in just the last, less than the last decade, you've had over 220 businesses move from where? California alone to Texas. And with that have brought over $6 billion of investment with them. And that number continues to go, go up. And so Texas, even though we've had regional contraction of the 12 economic regions, if you're in the Permian Basin, if you're in the Houston area, those areas have literally seen a recession locally. However, the state of Texas did not go through a recession. And so if you look at the revenue estimate that I laid out yesterday, which there's two different parts. One is what's called discretionary spending, which is our state tax dollars that come in and what the legislature has discretion over to spend, which is the number that I give them. I don't talk about the federal dollars that comes into your state treasury. And so yesterday, I said for the next two-year budget, they would have $104.87 billion, roughly, say, $105 billion. Now, that is a little lower than what I said that they had for the budget that ends this August, which was roughly about $108 billion. So about $2.7 billion less, roughly a few percentage points. So you hear this cries and the screams, and, and the reality is that's not necessarily – because Texas has a down economy. We've had fewer revenues come in, mainly from the oil and gas industry, to give you one example. In 2015, that that year that we call fiscal 2015, we brought in $1.8 billion in sales tax from the oil industry. In 2016, which we closed the books in August of last year on, that number dropped down to $800 million. So that was a $900 million drop, almost a billion dollars, which is going to be expected in a downturn. Second thing, when we close the books in August of this year, I only expect in the general treasury, not counting our state's savings account, which is something we'll talk about in a second, but the general treasury, I expect only to have $1.5 billion, but still a billion, that's a significant amount of money, when we move and close out August and start the new calendar year and the new budget cycle in September. Two years ago, that number was 7.3. So that's factor number two. And then factor number three is because we as the voters approved, I don't know if anybody listening has ever been stuck in traffic or drove down a road in rural Texas with a pothole. So the fact is we need to put more money into infrastructure. And so the legislature approved a constitutional amendment we as voters approved it overwhelmingly that we would start dedicating $2.5 billion of sales tax revenue starting September of this year when the new budget cycle hits. And so we estimate that the first year won't quite be $2.5 billion. It will be $2.2 billion. The second year of the budget will be two point five. So that ends up being $4.7 billion that – is not there that would normally be available for the legislature because it's going to roads. But infrastructure, as I've always said, any economy that does not take care of its infrastructure is going to deteriorate and decline, and you need to put money into infrastructure, whether it's roads, water. Those are the things you need to take care of, and and it's a combination of those three things. But again, at the end of the day, the legislature will put a budget together. The sun's going to come up tomorrow, and Texas is still a great place to call home. 
So uh, remember, folks, you're on a live call with Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager. He, he works for you, uh, statewide elected official, been serving as our comptroller now um, uh, halfway through his four-year term. Um, if you have questions or comments, just press star three on your home phone. We've got Matt, Aaron, uh, Clayton, Steve, uh, Carrie, we've got a lot of folks here hanging in the Q&A queue. We'll get to them here in just a moment. If you're listening on Facebook and you have a question or comment, you can either dial the number uh, that's there on your screen or you can um, uh, just throw your question or comment there into the box and we'll get those to you. Like this question from a CJ, uh, excuse me, a CG David, um, uh, Mr. David, um, or Ms. David, uh, CG <laughs> writes, um, uh, and they're talk talking actually about a part of your job a lot of folks are unaware of. As comptroller, you produce a myriad of really fascinating reports about state spending, about the state's economy, about uh, various sectors um, of the state's economy, as well as local governments. And uh, so uh, CG David asks, can you develop a better statistical report for cities and counties? An example is the old hot quarterly report. It would help voters see where and how their money is uh, uh, how their money is affecting their area. Um, any, any chance of, uh, of, of reviving the old hot quarterly reports? Yeah, that's that's a great question. One of the things that when I came into office, uh, my predecessor Susan Combs, she did a great job about transparency in government, not only in state but in local government, trying to shine the bright light much brighter on government finances and through time though technology has enabled us to understand and see things much clearer on the internet say for example you can pick something up on your phone an ipad a computer what transparency is in 2017 is vastly different than what it was 10 years ago and so coming into office one of the one of the areas that i revamped one, we've completely overhauled our entire website. In fact, the entire website has not been overhauled for 20 years. Imagine that. So we brought everything into one and made it actually something in 2017 and used current resources within the agency to do it. But what I was going to mention is there's a program called Transparency Stars because I don't have the authority to force local governments to provide transparency. And so my thought was to try to use the old carrot mechanism whereby we wanted to raise the level of transparency because I don't it, – it's great if someone actually puts their CAFR online for you to read. However, who's going to read the comprehensive financial report? It's going to take a lot of detail to understand it. You need a chart, a one graph that you can drill down into and get deeper and deeper. And I, I analogize that to you know today. We don't use microfiche anymore. When I was in college, I had to go through it, and it gave me a headache. Today's world, we don't have to do that. And so the Transparency Stars program, and we've got uh, local governments that are participating where they are putting much more information out locally for people to see, and we raise the bar, not just on finances, but also on debt from a local level. Also, another qualifier is pensions, which is a significant issue in this country in credit rating and what the taxpayers are on the hook for in the future. The next one is contracts and procurement, as in what goes on to putting contracts in place and transparency there at the local level. And the last one, this is my favorite one, economic development incentives, because that is a black hole that no one ever has a clue what's going on. Again, I don't have – to go get the local information and from, to go get that data because they're not required to give it to me, I have to do a freedom of information request, and we have done that in certain situations. However – this was a way to provide a carrot and competition among those local entities to try to raise the bar for transparency locally. Uh, so, uh, again, folks are on a live call with our comptroller, Glenn Hager. If you've got a question or comment, press star three. Um, and, and, uh, looking here, uh, the Matt I referred to a moment ago, uh, turns out um, I'm being told he is actually State Representative Matt Schaefer. Uh, so, uh, Representative Schaefer, uh, thanks for uh, being uh, for participating this evening. Uh, what is your question? I want to start with you uh, for uh, Comptroller Glenn Hager. Comptroller Hager, thank you for your work. This is good information you're putting out tonight. Good to see you. Good to be with you tonight, man. Hey, talking about the you know the 1.5 billion that you say will be remaining in the general treasury uh, for the remaining uh, biennium. Uh, up through the end of August, right. um, you know, we're now in legislative session, and we will be considering 
issues in the budget where we may need to fill some holes, things like early childhood intervention funding or, or Medicaid funding that maybe we didn't anticipate. Yeah. But, but there are some constitutional constraints on how much more we can spend. And perhaps for conservatives, we just have like this, you know, population plus inflation mark that we also look at. So, so relative to that 1.5 billion remaining, will you be able to sort of give us a, a pretty close estimate for budget writers as to how much we could spend? Yeah, great, great question. And let me, for all the viewer, all the listeners, uh, two things: your state constitution puts two limits on your legislature as to how much money they can spend. Number one, and not necessarily in this order, is the biennial revenue estimate, which I presented yesterday. That is an estimate of how much money will come into your state treasury starting September of this year, so nine months out, and then ending two years later. So that's one limit. And then the second limit is called the constitutional spending limit, and that takes the budget from last time, Plus, whether there's any, what you're asking, Representative, any supplemental appropriations, some needs that Child Protective Services has been talked a lot about in, in, in a lot of areas these days, and I need to pay workers maybe more to make sure their caseloads are down. And so you take the last budget times population inflation, and that gives you a new number that you can spend up to. So you all spent in the last legislative session for discretionary spending, the numbers we're talking about here that, that you have discretion over for state dollars. You spent $106 billion. Now, under that spending cap you're mentioning, we estimate that you would actually have under that cap another $2.7 billion. Now, the $1.5 billion that I mentioned, that's in the Treasury, and you can spend that on supplemental needs. You can cash carry over that to the next legislative biennium and spend it into the next biennium. So either way, you have that discretion over it, but regardless, you can't spend more than that $1.5 billion because I estimate that's all we'll have that, that we could pay for at the end of August, or you can roll it over. And the other limit is the $2.5 billion that you all left unspent that you didn't spend in the last legislative session. Hopefully that answers your question. Mr. Schaefer, thank you so much for, for taking part in the call. Let's uh, uh, go up to Tarrant County and visit with Julie. Julie, thank you so much for uh, being with us. What's your question for Comptroller Glenn Hager? Well, thanks for letting me ask a question. Thanks for hosting. And um, Glenn, first of all, I would um, just like to thank you for doing this. I think it's valuable for the grassroots to understand what exactly your role is. And if there is a time when you'd like to come and speak with Northeast Tarrant Tea Party, we would love to have you do that. Love to. Thank um, you for inviting me. That would be great. We should get that scheduled. So, yeah. um, But my question is this. So sometimes the revenue estimate is overestimated, and sometimes it's underestimated because – you know, obviously the goal for any comptroller would be to be spot on, but that just doesn't always happen. So I would really like your opinion, um, and, and this is coming from a limited government kind of a standpoint, mm -hmm. if it's not going to be exact, would it be better for the estimate to be a little under or a little over? And it, it's better to be under. And two years ago, I was asked the question over and over and over after I laid out the revenue mm -hmm. estimate, is this a conservative estimate? Is this a conservative estimate? Now, that was by the media. And really what they were trying to ask the question in another way, did you lowball the figure? That's really the question they were trying to ask. And so it depends on how you use that term. And the fact is, as I tell people in every speech that I give, is there anyone in this room with 100% certainty in your own mind, don't blurt the number out because it's none of my business, but in your own mind, can you estimate how much money will come into your personal household starting nine months from now? So not tomorrow, but nine months from now and ending two years later. And usually I get a bunch of chuckles and laughs and think, that's so silly. Why did you even ask us that question? And then I come back around and make the point, well, that's my job times 28 million people, 13 million employees, a $1.6 trillion economy with 12 economic regions, and by the way, the 10th largest economy in the world. So my point, Julie, is you're never going to be spot on, and you're much better because there is a wide variety of factors that goes into an estimate. You're much better to have a lower number than a higher number because why? You want to make sure that you don't overspend. That's the thing you don't ever want to do is overspend. And that's why most controllers will always try to make sure that they're on the conservative side to use that term or the term that just fact is you, you don't want 
to take too many assumptions in and be too lofty that the economy is going to grow much bigger than reality would show it would be. And, and I should note that that was Julie McCarty of the Northeast Tarrant Tea Party. Um, I, I didn't quite catch in my head who that was there. Uh, uh, Julie McCarty, one of the real taxpayer uh, champion watchdogs out there uh, keeping track of elected officials. And uh, if you happen to be in the Metroplex, uh, you can learn more about uh, the work of the Northeast Tarrant Tea Party at netarranttparty.com or just Google Northeast Tarrant. Tea Party, and you'll, and you'll find them. Uh, so, Julie McCarty, thank you so much for, for that question and for being with us this evening. Uh, right now, let's go down to, uh, uh, looks like, uh, to Steve. Steve, thank you so much for uh, being with us uh, this evening. Steve, what's your question for Comptroller Glenn Hager? Hey, Michael, Steve Coke. Uh, Glenn, it's fun to be with you guys. This is like hey, a good to be with you today. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Yeah, this is like a, it's like a grassroots family reunion. Um, hey, so um, we, we're going to take a little bit of a hit on the revenue side this year, um, uh, and, and um, I, I really appreciate the fact that you are being safe and secure and holding the House and the Senate's feet to the fire to make sure that, that we're spending the money judiciously. Um, over the past um, two years in our county alone, um, property values have soared 20%. While the real estate market has been absolutely stagnant, wages have been stagnant, is there going to be room in the budget for property tax reform that your office over the past five, six years, you and Susan before you, have done such a great job talking about just the crisis, the, the um, unprecedented growth in property taxes in Texas? Yeah, that's a great question, Steve, and your area, and then also whether, you know, where my family lives in Katy, when I get to come back home on the weekends, or whether it's in Austin area, or as I travel around the state, I mean, back up in Tarrant County, where Julie's at, I mean, just all over the state, we've seen property values go up, and the pressure is significant on homeowners and, and businesses that, that have a set budget, and so property taxes relief, as well as really all tax relief, is extremely critical. Now, you know, those questions, that's I mean, the fact is, I've got my opinions. I try to stay within my branch's role of government. Um, the fact is, I strongly believe in the constitutional checks and balances and, and the different branches of government. And so my point being is, you know, when I move from the policymaker to this position, I've tried to make sure I provide the facts, the data, the number that people can have to make the decisions, and then ultimately whether there's some type of tax cuts this legislative session you know, that's, that's up for the legislature to try to decide. And so, you know, the fact is, is within the budget that we have, once they get a committee assignments, they'll get started and then start figuring out where do we go from here. But the fact is, you're right. I mean, property taxes are extremely high in the state and they're overburdensome. I mean, the fact is, is not having a property tax system would be the best system. But the problem is trying to phase that over over time has always been extremely difficult and one that's almost nearly impossible with so many different branches of the government that have a taxation system on property taxes. So we're a live statewide call with Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager. If you have a question or a comment during our time together, just press star three on your home phone. If you happen to be uh, listening to this on Facebook, um, you can either dial the number on your screen or throw your questions and comments uh, there into the box, and we'll be uh, and we'll try to get to, to as many questions, comments as we can during our time together. Right now, let's go out though to uh, West Texas and visit with um, Aubrey. Aubrey, thank you so much uh, for uh, being with us. What's your question for Comptroller Hager? Yes, sir. Basically, uh, I'm moving. I work in the oil patch, and our hours that we've been working have almost doubled from what they were last year. I was wondering what his outlook was on on the oil industry and oil prices. Yeah, no, that's he a great some, question. What oh, are you finished? I'm sorry, Aubrey. I was just saying you have a kind of broader view than what a lot of us have. We just see what we're seeing out here. Yes, sir. No, that's a great question. Uh, it, it, it's been amazing to watch the rig count here in Texas and across the U.S. I'll tell you one fact is if you look across the United States. There is one oil play, one field in the entire United States, whereby we are continuing to produce at the same levels of production, that is, at the same highs of what we produced just a year ago. And you know where that's at? The Permian Basin. 
So production mm-hmm. has rolled significantly down in the Eagleford Shell and other parts of the country. However, the Permian continues to, and you're seeing more activity in the Permian Basin. Interestingly, if you look at the rigs that have stood up here in the last month here in the United States, especially, is that 49% of all the active rigs operating in the United States, again, 49% are where? In Texas. So the activity is much more economically feasible at $53, which roughly we're at $53 today, going up to $60. What we estimate, what we're using in our revenue estimate is for the rest of this year, we estimate that oil will only be around right at $48, even though it's higher today, but you got to understand I've already had five months in the budget under the current year that we're in, so that's the reason it's a little bit less than the $53 you see today. However, I think in 2018, starting September of this year, that new fiscal year, we moved that up to $55 and then ultimately $59 after that. I think we're in a period of time where it's – you're going to see roughly 50 some odd dollar oil. So I don't, I don't see barring something happening in the Middle East or some global shutdown of a major supply route in some shape, form, or fashion. Will you see a pike, a spike in the dollar per barrel? However, you're going to continue to see more activity in West Texas, and potentially because the Permian Basin is the most economically feasible play here in the United States. Let's uh, go over to uh, Mark, who's got a uh, question about uh, debt. Mark, thank you so much for uh, being with us this evening. Uh, Mark, what's your question for Comptroller Glenn Hager? Yes, Mr. Hager, uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, what I would like to know is how, what is the total debt that Texas is under and the uh, highest counties in Texas, what is that debt, and then the city? what that is there and what are we doing to account for paying that stuff off yeah that that's a great question if you if you look across the state of texas typically the counties and the cities where you have the highest debt levels are in your major larger metropolitan areas whether that's in the houston area the metroplex whether that's in uh bear county uh say for example uh, bear county the hospital district has has quite a bit of debt level there if you look at Texas as a state compared to other states, our local governments here in Texas, on average, and averaging it out across the state of Texas, has more debt load per uh, individual than any other state with the exception of New York. So we have a much higher local debt level load, and that also, when I say that, is including our local school districts too, so all types of local government. However, if you look at the state level, that is much lower than across. The state has a constitutional limit that we cannot have more than 5% debt per, per our discretionary spending, per se, for, for simplicity purposes. Texas today has a percent of our gross state product. Roughly, we have about 3% debt compared to our gross state product. We're on the local level. That's higher and up to over 13%. So my point being is the state – has a has a large number of debt, but if you take into account the size and the scope of this economy, it's a much smaller percentage. And there's some debt that has been authorized by the legislature, but has not been executed by the agencies that have been authorized that. So there's roughly been about 4% that has been authorized and it's a little over 3% that has actually been issued here in the state of Texas. All right, folks, we're on a live call with Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager. Uh, we've got quite a few folks uh, in the queue to ask questions um, by phone. They've pressed star three or they've dialed in one or the other uh, to ask questions. Also got a couple of folks um, asking questions from, uh, from Facebook. Uh, for example, Joe Palmer uh, writes, my understanding is that the Permanent Education Fund serves as the guarantee for the school bond debt in Texas. Can you please explain the decision-making process that is involved in determining how much money is kept in the permanent education fund and whether or not the increase in total school bond debt is accompanied by an increase in funds that are put into the to the to, in, into that fund? Um, you know, that, you know, that's a pretty complex question there for you, Mr. Hager. But um, you know, talk a little bit about the you know, the decision-making process for the permanent education fund. 
Right. Yeah. The fact the fact is is one. I'll just say my office doesn't handle the the permanent education school fund. That's really left up to kind of a combination where there's certain certain dollars on our state properties under a general land office, which is uh, George P. Bush's administration, and others are over at the state board of education, and those elected individuals at the state board of education that oversee that fund and how it is invested and what are the rate of returns and those certain amount of dollars that are provided to the legislature so then they can actually use those to not in other words you don't want to take down on what is the principle that is in the fund but a certain amount of returns then gets to utilize for purchasing school books and things like that it is a backstop for the local debt However, the locals are responsible for their debt. So it has really been a backstop, in other words, to allow for cheaper bond ratings on that debt as the state backing it up. However, the locals are responsible for it. So it's, it's kind of a, a very, mm-hmm. unfortunately, complex situation in how that works. But again, the locals are ultimately responsible for it, and I don't have the data offhand, so I'll have to go look it up as to if that has ever been put into place and how many times that the state has actually had to bail out on the local level. That one I would have to go find out to be able to completely answer your question. Uh, Mr. Hager, last session uh, you introduced a, um, a series, or you presented to the legislature, excuse me, a series of taxes. Uh, that were obsolete, taxes that were inefficient, that were more expensive to uh, to collect than than the netted the state. And uh, Steve um, Kushner, I believe, on Facebook um, is asking, are there any policies that uh, that you would like to sunset this session uh, relating to duplicative spending programs or just generally in terms of the operations that you oversee, um, things that you are wanting to see done this session? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we're always just kind of like I do in my household. I mean, at the end of every year and throughout the year, but especially at the end of the year, I scrub our budget. And is there where are there areas that we can be more efficient, effective, and save money? And it's the same thing that we do in, in our state agency. We don't have to go through the legislative process to do that. We should be doing that internally. And so there's there are not any programs that where I need to go to the legislature to ask them to eliminate. There are things where I think that you know, fact is we need to be given the flexibility. Say, for example, the question was asked earlier about making sure you shine better light on local government. Also, last legislative session, as an example, we were given the authority to go and put a list, a one-stop list of all the entities that have eminent domain authority in the state of Texas because literally there's thousands and no one has a clue who they are. And there needs to be somewhere. Now, that's not obviously not in the wheelhouse of – the revenue estimator, the tax collector, and also the people that run the finance treasury. However, that needs to be somewhere that is clear and visible for individuals. So there's not anything that I feel this session that I've got to go get the legislature to eliminate. I think that we have the flexibility and the power within to make some of those adjustments to make it easier and better for the people of the state of Texas. Because, I mean, in fact, that's who we work for. I mean, you're, you're our customers. You're the taxpayers. That's who we're answerable to. Uh, let's now go to uh, Austin and uh, talk to uh, Nell. Nell, thank you so much for uh, being with us this evening. Hello, Nell, are you there? Yes. Yes. Hi, you're, uh, you're yes, on I'm with uh, Comptroller Glenn Hager. Okay, thank you. Sir, I gave my report that I was so proud of what you're doing because I'm only 90, but I'm very active. And I realized I was born in Amarillo. I'm a retired military wife. And I realized so many more mature people do not understand everything that's going on in our beloved state. But I want to tell you how much I appreciate what you're doing and you're making the effort to really keep us informed. And that is what is needed. And I thank you very much for what you're doing. And God bless you. Thank you, Nell, and God bless you too. I think that. I mean, it's the taxpayer's money, and it's the taxpayer's government, and people need to be informed, and they need to be able to have that that information easily and readily accessible. And I just say thank you for at 90 years old, you're still engaged and still active, and I wish that people would take that lead and be much more involved in government because if they were, our government would work a lot better for the taxpayers who we're ultimately answerable to. 
You know, Mr. Hager, I couldn't help but think, you know, uh, wouldn't it be great if uh, people who were a half or a third of uh, Nell's um, age were as involved and active as she apparently is? I, I think that would be fabulous for the Lone Star State to have a lot more Nell's running around. That, that's exactly the case. I and mean, when I went and uh, give you an example, talked to a bunch of young conservatives, I made the point to them. I said, you know, your, your age demographic, especially of, of conservatives at that age, are not in, are not engaged, and you have the most to win and lose in the future. Look at the federal administration for the last eight years; they have more to lose from a life expectancy perspective than anyone else. Yet they're the least engaged. How ironic is that? Let's go up to uh, Tarrant County um, and visit with Aaron. Aaron, thank you so much for uh, being with us this evening. Aaron, uh, what's your question for Comptroller Glenn Hager? Well, thanks, uh, Glenn and Michael, both for doing this. And I want to cheat. I want to throw in two questions real quick. Glenn, you talked earlier about the uh, <laughs> the rating system and kind of kind of having a disclosure on that. I really appreciate that. As somebody who's engaged in local government uh, politics, I really uh, appreciate that tool. It's very good for us. But local debt ballot uh, ballot transparency for local debt for bond elections is a big issue for the for the conservatives and for the grassroots and. And for a lot of the local elected officials as well, and your office has, has led in this in the past. And my question is, will this be something that your office asks the legislature to address this session? So that's my first question. My second question is, in the past, we've seen the legislature uh, give the comptroller budget that is quote-unquote balanced to uh, fulfill the statute obligation, but it's really filled with gimmicks. And my question to you is, what will your office's perspective be on those gimmicks? if they're used again this year, because I foresee that coming. Yeah, that, th those are two great questions. I'll take the, the second one first, if, if you don't mind. Is The fact is, if the legislature, from a, and I got that question quite a bit here in towns when I was running for this office, and I think that's a, that's a really fantastic question. The fact is, if the legislature provides me a budget that even if it has a gimmick, it's balanced and it works. Say, for example, as Representative Schaefer was asking earlier, if there were some needs that were unmet in the current budget that they passed and come back in whether they either make cuts somewhere else to pay for that or they use the 1.5 billion that is left available to for that the fact is i think that taxpayers should know exactly how this is put together and so the point being is if it's balanced and it works whether it has gimmicks or not in it that is a certifiable budget even if you say well that shouldn't be and, and i don't disagree with that However, I do feel as though it's my responsibility and others to inform people that this is how it was put together and that there is, if you use, say, for example, school, uh, school finance payments for 24 months and you don't make 24, month, 24 payments, you make 23. Well, you didn't fully fund schools, for example. And so my first legislative session in 2003, that happened. And I went to my voters, and I went to my town halls and everywhere else, and I explained exactly what really happened because I didn't want people to misunderstand and think that all of this money was cut when in reality there was some gimmicks in there as well. And I think that people need to know that. So that, that's how I, I see that we have to make sure that my office keeps it honest in that mechanism and manner, make sure the voters are, are, are fully fully informed. And then – Lastly, on the other question, the ballot transparency for local debt I think is extremely important and bonds are extremely important. We've talked a lot about in some publications that we have about certificates of obligation. Say, for example, how that has ballooned over the course of the last several years, and that's a mechanism that actually doesn't go to the ballot. That's something that local government can do without even going to the ballot. That's extremely important because you don't even get a vote in that. And so that's one that we just recently wrote an article about to bring greater awareness to. I don't have an initiative to the legislature this session on that transparency, but that goes into the Transparency STARS program that I mentioned, which is voluntary because I don't have any authority over local government to put competition in them that they need to make this process much more transparent for the taxpayers, and they shouldn't take dollars that were bonded and use them for some other purpose because apparently the program, the project was – actually cheaper well the fact is was the bond overinflated, so then you can use something for somewhere else and those are the points that we're trying to make sure we have transparency in that new program that we put out let's right now go over to uh carrie carrie thank you so much for uh being with us what's your question for uh comptroller glenn hager this evening 
Thank you, Controller Hager. We appreciate your transparency uh, going on the air like this. This is great. We'd like to see more of this. I'm speaking in behalf of myself and our ranching business here for my family in Texas and New Mexico, and also historic Texas ranches, which are a very informal group of about 24 ranches up here in the Panhandle that are old family ranches. We appreciate your transparency. And how many how many years have y'all had y'all's ranch? Uh, since 1880, which is honestly when the original Americans left the area in about 76 or 77. So my great grandfather was here pretty fast. <laughs> that, that that's good. I was just showing my my kids my uh, my dad had given me an old family tree, and they said, "Where are we?" And I said, "Well." Your four generations past this family tree, and I was explaining to them how my family, how the two brothers that came over from Germany, one in 1846, and then my line got here in 1848, and landed in Galveston, and moved up to a little community called Hockley, Texas, off Highway 290. So it was that was kind of fun. That's the reason I had to ask that question in part because I was just going through that with my kids before I came back to get on this call. So thanks for for being part of Texas and the history. That's fantastic. Yeah, I I speak Hockley, and you almost read my mail about families coming from Germany. So uh, <laughs> here we are. Uh, well, we'll have to get together are. and have a beer someday. Yeah, we As good old German. <laughs> I came to visit you the first day, I think, that you were elected senator, I believe. And uh, you were so busy, but you were gracious enough to visit with me. And I appreciate that. My yes, question, uh, because otherwise I'll talk all night with you. <laughs> my, <laughs> my question is, I know you have enforcement divisions that deal with companies and businesses, and I'm not anti-business or anything, but... There are tax benefits, uh, such as, and I'm in the oil business, so I know I'm familiar with the oil benefits that they get from taxation, the lack of taxation, uh, and they contribute a lot, too. But there are instances where they overstay their welcome, so to speak. They continue to have taxes waived long beyond when their eligibility is. And I know you have enforcement division division that goes after that sort of thing and i think you should publicize that more i think that would help people to kind of stay on the straight and narrow maybe i'm old-fashioned but uh no but anyway I, I, I i appreciate you saying that because i tell people all the time that that my office we should be there to help and work with the taxpayers and we should not be in a situation to where we're overburdensome to where we are stymieing the creation of jobs however I've said very clearly all the time to, to anybody that you know I could talk to, I said, look, if you're not paying your taxes, you're essentially cheating the state government, then you're really not cheating government. You're cheating the person who's to your right or to your left. And the fact is, is when people commit fraudulent behavior in those types of manners, in this administration, we're going to shut them down. I mean, earlier today, my, my chief of staff was asking me about somebody that – He's been behind on his sales tax. We've been trying to uh, make sure that he got caught up. I don't want to put anyone out of business. However, the problem is is they have let that go along far enough to where now the taxes have gotten bigger, that they owe the state of Texas, and there's really not any desire to pay. And the fact is is they have people that come in, pay the taxes. Those taxpayers expect them to be sent because they're paying their share, and when somebody's essentially stealing them, then we have to take action and do something about it. Those are on a live call with Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager. Um, I, I can't let um, this question go unasked, so I'm going to uh, go over to um, Mark. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for uh, being with us this evening. Uh, Mark, what's your question for Glenn Hager? Hello, Mark. One once, Mark. Well, Mark was going to ask you, uh, when are you going to run for governor? Can't you know, can't, can't have a I can't, can't have a friend doing a show like this with with uh, I guess uh, you know something like uh, twenty thousand of your closest friends hanging on the line uh, w w without a little bit of an embarrassing question. So, uh, uh, Mark, interested in your political future uh, despite today just being the first day of the legislative session? 
Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I plan to ultimately run for re-election again. That, that's my plan. But as I've told a few folks here in the last few weeks that's asked that question, what's my plan? So I plan to run for re-election. But after legislative session, like I always do, I'm going to sit down with my wife, my children, and we're going to make a family decision because this, this type of job requires commit, a commitment from the entire family. And that's even the commitment from my 11-year-old daughter, my 8-year-old daughter, and my 8-year-old son. Because if dad's going to be gone or he's going to be traveling, giving speeches to groups, which I should be doing because they're the voters, they need to know what's going on, that takes a family commitment. So I, I love what I'm doing. I'd love to have the privilege to, to work on these issues. It's exciting to me, and I've got a passion for it. So I, if the voters allow me to do it again, I, I plan to come back and try to do it for more years. And then who knows after that? I may say, you know, I'm, I'm getting pretty jaded at 46 years old, and I'm really tired of government. So at some point, I don't think I can stand much more of that place. Well, I know all of us in Power Texans uh, appreciate the uh, the great work that you're doing before you completely uh, uh, you know throw up your hands and uh, go run, go running back to the uh, to the family farm. Uh, folks can find all the great reports put together by the uh, Comptroller's Office at comptroller.texas.gov. They can Google Texas Comptroller or Glenn Hager and and get there. Um, I know that your, uh, your your wife and three kids have been very generous with me and all the folks participating in the uh, program this evening, and we appreciate that, um, let, uh, letting you uh, spend some time with us tonight. So uh, before we uh, let you, though, go running off, uh, go running back back to them and uh, spend a, what's left of the evening with them, uh, walk folks though how they can uh, walk folks through how they can contact you and um, and 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 how maybe folks can be helpful to the work of the Texas Comptroller. Absolutely, that that's a great question, and you know we can be reached at Glenn ha Glenn dot Hager at cpa dot texas dot gov. That's that email address again, Glenn dot Hager at cpa dot texas dot gov. Also five one two four six three forty four forty four. Again, that's 512-463-4444, or you can contact me if you want me to uh, come give a speech, come talk to a community. I'd love to do that, happy to do that. Just contact that number or send us an email, or if it's from uh, more of a political side, then that's just Glenn Hager at yahoo.com, Glenn Hager at yahoo.com. If, it, if it's more of a political event, not just kind of a taxpayer-type deal, then then we can set that up as well, and we'd love the opportunity to do that. So. If anything else, I just appreciate everybody listening, everybody participating. What I would ask is I know it gets tiring, it gets exhausting, but it's extremely important to be engaged in the political con political process because, unfortunately or fortunately, elections have consequences, and when we don't get engaged, it goes the other direction. And in order to have liberty and freedom, I gave this speech to a group of former military retired people the other day, and I, I made the comment. I said, when you woke up this morning, how many of you were concerned with your personal security today? And nobody raised their hand. I said, you know why you did? You didn't because you wore the uniform, and there's people serving around this country and around the world who's wearing the uniform today. And they, they have given us the liberties and freedoms, and if we're not engaged in the political process, we don't get to defend and make sure that we have those liberties and freedoms. So that's my own personal soapbox, but that's my own plea to the listeners tonight. I know everybody is engaged and is preaching to the choir, but it's extremely important in order to maintain that for future generations. Well, again, uh, Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager, thank you so much for uh, your time. Thank you for your service to the people of Texas. Appreciate you being a watchdog for Texas uh, taxpayers in the control. Um, uh, again, really appreciate your time. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for participating in this uh, live teleform with Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager. Um, uh, we are going to be ending tonight's uh, time together, but this program will be continue to be available, the audio up on Facebook. If you have questions or comments, you can throw them in the, in the question or comment box, even if you're watching this um, as a recording, and we'll make sure that those get over to Comptroller Hager's office. So again, thanks for being with us. May God bless you, and through you, may God bless the great state of Texas. Good night, everyone.